Hey everybody, welcome to this edition of UGA Sports Live. I am your host, my name is Ronnie DeBolsey. I am joined by Dane Young, who is over at the uh, Grady School of Journalism, doing Grady School of Journalism stuff at UGA, and of course, coming from his home theater as Coach Donham, the former Georgia Bulldogs head coach, the Hall of Famer himself. The only reason everyone's tuned again on a Tuesday at noon on a dreary day to pay attention to this show, we, we know who the star is. <laughs> I'm not going to make any bones about it. You're here to hear, hear – you are here to hear Coach Don, and we appreciate that. Of course, uh, place would not – this show would not be available or possible without our friends at Athens Ford, Your Pie, Prime Shrimp, Dead Soxy, My Perfect Franchise, and Academia Brewing Company. Shout out to all them. We will mention them later on in the show. So stick around for the commercials. I know you enjoy them. Coach, Georgia is now the SEC East champs yet again. They go into a hostile environment in Mississippi State. Dane was there. Dane can tell you how nasty it was. Uh, cold game. Uh, Tight game in the first half, uh, a little frustrating there towards the end. But I mean, it's still a, as you as you and I watch the game, and it's nip and tuck as it seemed. Georgia wins by a handy margin, uh, very beat the spread. I should be upset about that, but a lot of Georgia fans were just a little. They didn't want to be that tight. They didn't want to be that nervous for that long during that game. But I think we need to point out the fact that. Kirby Smart has won the SEC East yet again, and they didn't celebrate. There was like one sign. They didn't really talk about it. How, how is that real? I mean, I remember the SEC East being a big damn deal, and everyone's like, oh, well, that's good. I mean, that's nice. You know, it's like getting free fries with your entree or something, but no one really cares. Yeah, I think they probably had their own little private celebration. But Kirby's thinking ahead, and he doesn't want to let his uh... – guard down publicly but i mean realistically uh, when you dominate the league like we have uh particularly the last two years i mean you got to go on and finish it up against kentucky but uh, i'm interested to hear from dane uh, right off the bat about the atmosphere and being down there live and then after his take then i'll come back in there but uh, don't want to take any of your thunder so what what was your uh, what was your take being down there and then i'll give you my synopsis of the game dane yeah, first time I'd been to Starkville, and I thought Georgia fans turned out, and they were pretty loud. Had about a quarter of the stadium, maybe getting closer to a third. Mississippi State fans show up, and they do get loud, and the cowbells are a thing. And Georgia just played right on through it. I, I thought it was really impressive. It was a very cold and um, uninviting game in the sense of it's like you could tell a lot of people just were uncomfortable. In fact, uh, it was Javon Buller just came out beforehand uh, in warmups and just like kept running around constantly, just trying to find warmth in there. Uh, I, I like the atmosphere at Mississippi State. It's the only SEC school that I think you can get to the stadium with zero traffic. Like we get within a mile of the stadium. And my wife's cousin, who who went with us, she looked. He he looked over and he was like, "Hey, there are the lights for the stadium." He, you think that's the stadium? Well, yeah, that's the only lights in Starkville. So, uh, <laughs> it, it was fantastic. I, I I thought Georgia had a really good performance in a tough situation. A lot of really good teams have gone there and struggled, and Georgia wasn't perfect, but it, the game was never in question. Yeah, I was uh, really impressed with the way uh, we started. Then uh, we really kind of shot ourselves in the foot with a couple interesting decisions. But uh, at the same time, uh, you know, Kirby owned up to it. The players owned up to it. Uh, that's uh, when you have the kind of adversity that uh, happens sometime in football games, you've got to be careful that you don't let it uh, bother you too much and give the other team too much credit. So, I think the, the way we started out the second half just put, really kind of put uh, put any kind of doubt in the mind of uh, anybody that George is going to go ahead and win the game. But uh, one of the things I tried to do last week uh, secretly was look into the preparation a little bit because you're playing against a team that has different type of uh, offense and defense than you normally see. Now, we've heard about Tennessee and what they do and, uh, you know, things like that, but uh, – this air raid thing, which we saw against uh, Sanford a little bit, is something that uh, has either been really good for Coach Leach or really bad. I mean, when they throw for over 300, they win. When they under 300, they don't do much. And I just thought our preparation, the way we uh, mixed up our coverages, the way we got enough pressure, and it can't be said enough about the impact of uh, Jalen Carter on our team at this point. Just the fact that he has come in there and uh, – given a little life to the front a little bit just from the standpoint if you want to run on us try running at me i'll just throw you around if you want to uh single block me which i thought was very poor by uh 
Coach Leach's staff to think kind of reminded me of uh, Lincoln Riley when they played the championship game, uh, the first round of the playoffs against Oklahoma and uh, against uh, Alabama. And they thought they could single block Quinn and Williams. And it took them a whole quarter to realize that they couldn't. And the game was over. Same thing Saturday to, to have that center helping out on uh, other guys instead of helping on Jalen Carter was ridiculous, but I'm glad they did that. <laughs> but I think it, what it does with our team, you got a guy there that, that everybody in our program from knows is just a dominating guy because you have to go against him every day. But it just gives you that presence of, of, a, of a guy that you know, kind of like on offense, you know Bowers is going to play good. You know he's going to do everything humanly possible to help you win. You know Bennett is, but you, you got one of your all-star guys. And I heard Kirby say, hey, look, we need to get him in there as much as we can. You know, we're not going to have him much longer. So uh, let's don't let him be on the sideline. Let's use him. And he, he gives you just a different approach on your pressure. If you look how much better we're pressuring a quarterback since he started playing, even without uh, anybody else, then, then that's really affected the game. And then offensively, I just think the fact that we're spreading the ball around so much, uh, people keep talking about a running game. It's hard to run on a 3-3-5. Three, three, I'm just telling you, it's, you don't see it every week. It's different people coming off the edge, you guys. But we, we did just enough effectively on that. And then the comeback kid, Lance, you know, Lad McConkey just really did do what he needed to. And then we got a senior performance from Kiaris Jackson, made two outstanding catches. I'm talking about big time sports center replays that he made that really uh, sealed the deal in a lot of ways. When you talk about touchdown passes, uh, I heard somebody talking about how many times this year that, that we've thrown the ball and been tackled on the one or two. We, we've got about seven or eight or maybe nine touchdown passes that ended up not being that that got tackled on the one or two that set up a score. You saw the one to Kiaris. You saw another one that got down to the one, of, I think, with McConkey there later on. So uh, I'm talking a little bit in circles here, except the fact that, that I do feel like that the team approach is what is getting us here. They've got their own identity. They're not worried about last year. Everybody knows their role. When your role is called on, look how long it's been since Karras has been called on in this kind of role, and he came through for us. The same thing true with Washington, like eight. He had eight targets the other night. He hadn't had that many in two or three games. So it's just a a very, very good group of kids that play hard together. And, you know, everybody's finding, well, it's hard to get up every week. It's hard to do this. But if you just look at our approach, except maybe the Missouri game, and that was out of kilter from the start. The wind was blowing over here. We couldn't fly out of, Atlanta, uh, of Athens. We had to drive a bus over there to uh, Atlanta. We're three, three hours late getting started. It just seemed like the whole trip was screwed up, and we didn't play very good in the first half. We came back and won the game. So here we are, uh, SEC East champs uh, going to Kentucky, and, you know, Kentucky's got to be pretty low right now, but, you know, they probably got a shot left in them for a little bit, but when you lose to Vanderbilt and South Carolina at home, that's not the kind of deal that's going to get Mark Stoops a bonus or Mark Stoops a, an increased contract. I can tell you that. Cause, they should be uh, in Missouri. I'll get, uh, I'll get an extension. <laughs> well, we'll talk about that a little bit later. But um, Hey, to elaborate, though, on a, a point that, that was, you make. Go ahead, Coach. I think that, was a, that had to be some kind of uh, – you know, I don't know what it was, but it was a really bad bonehead move by, by that team because uh, that program, because ever since he's got two million more for two more years, he's lost to uh, Kentucky and got killed by Tennessee. Coach, you mentioned Jalen Carter's injury recovery. I, I look at this and I say Georgia's peaking at the right time right now because of three injuries that have been recovered. Now, look, everyone's banged up this time of year. I get it. But Jalen Carter being back is the obvious that Georgia's team is just so much better with him. Underrated is Smile Munden being back in there for Georgia. And the combination of those two guys together and Dumas Johnson, Georgia's just getting its groove defensively, especially in that front seven. But then also from – my amateur eye, Roddy, I, I see Stetson Bennett looking more confident and composed. Whatever shoulder injury he was dealing with in the middle of the season, 
either he's recovered from it or he's learned to manage it better. Because the last three weeks, I thought he had two passes against Mississippi State that probably should have been interceptions and weren't. He had two that were interceptions, and that was just quirky, weird football stuff. But that, that, that's Stetson been in a nutshell. He has quirky, weird passes and stuff that should be picked off, and then he has bullets that are, you know, highlight reel throws. That's I, I didn't really notice the difference in him. I'm not doubting you. I love the compilation you did of him running in. He's tough. You know, I mean, he's a winner. Uh, how many games in a row has Georgia won? You know, regular season games, what, 25, something like that. Georgia has, you know, we were talking about in the group chat, Georgia has the possibility of going undefeated in the regular season back-to-back years. First time that's happened since the 70s. I mean, it's just nuts. And I don't think people make a big enough deal about the fact that you're SEC East champs. I, I'm, I'm old school. I think that's a big deal. But I want to talk about one thing Coach just said, <clears throat> getting up for these games, you know. And we asked Kirby Smart about this yesterday in the press conference. And, you know, it's like – you know, it's so easy to look past an SEC championship and look to the first round of the playoffs, look at the SEC championship. And he was asked a question, how do you keep your guys, you know, up for stuff like that? And he says, look, they can't we, – we don't let them be comfortable. And he made a good point, and it kind of ties in what both of you were saying. The guys that are doing it this year are not the guys that were there last year. There's a lot of new faces, new faces in the offensive front, new faces in the wide receiver room. We see Marcus Roseby Jackson come in. The, the biggest, uh, to me, you mentioned three guys who are playing healthy and playing better. I think getting Arian Smith back has been gigantic, just just as a threat. You know, just to, you got to keep your eye on him. You see 11 out there, you're like, all right, I remember the film studies. This guy has like six catches, but they all go for 35 yards or a TD. So if you're a safety, you're like, I'm supposed to help out with Brock Bowers, but I got to I gotta cut my eyes, eyes over at number 11 and getting him, you know, getting uh, – Jalen Carter back. I mean, it's was, it was like two different teams when we were watching the game when when he's in and when he's not. But you look at the guys. I mean, two new linebackers, three new guys in the secondary. You know, uh, all those new faces on the defensive front. It's two different teams. They're playing the same, so you kind of put them together. But I think Kirby mentioned he said these guys are connected and they want to make a name for themselves. They can, you know, they get the tro- the ring and they get all the accolades for winning last year, but they know that they were the backups. Coaches made this point many a time that those are the, the new guys that are out there. So they want to be Jordan Davis and to Devontae Wyatt and Lewis C. You know, they want all those accolades for themselves. I mean, they want to win it, but they want to be the guys winning it for Georgia. So I think yeah. that's the uh, – we're seeing that's that. Good. That's focus. a very good point. And uh, I think uh, – hey, Coach said that sets them the good. <laughs> I mean, I really believe that uh, the, the the competition we have at practice, yeah, uh, definitely helps you. And if you don't, if you slack up, uh, he'll sit your ass down. I mean, he doesn't care about. It. But let's get real here. We we've got at least, if you count Brock Bowers, who's got another year, we've got at least six first round draft choices on our team. Not many teams have that. Yeah, I mean, you, you go through uh, to Roderick the- Jones. Uh, Carter, uh, Keely Ringo, uh, Washington, uh, you know, Bowers. I mean, uh, and then uh, uh, Chris Smith could go early too. I mean, that's sick. That's Those are guys that – and then you don't even mention Nolan Smith. If he has a really good combine and, and just puts the word out there, you, you know, that when they, once they interview him and think, God, this guy brings a lot of leadership to our team and all these things. So – I can't poo-poo enough the fact that we were young and all, but after 10 games, you're not young. You've had a lot of spring practice. You've had a lot of practice reps out there. I, I, I think that people that listen to our podcast know that Georgia gets an inordinate amount of reps in their practice, super organized. They run three to one uh, reps compared to a game. So, and they're going against each other, which are good, t- you know, good players. So, uh, our experience level is good enough right now based on who we've been going against in the games and in practice. So the consummate uh, of uh, uh, you know, putting everybody together uh, with the great players and the young guys that are developing just makes us a, a very good football. And, and you add uh, an Einstein IQ quarterback that makes plays with his feet that makes the right decisions, that checks off. Sure, he had two interceptions. That was a miraculous one-hand catch the guy made. The other one, his elbow was hit. It's amazing. Uh, as much as we throw the ball, we don't have more interceptions. But uh, I would say 
if there's ever been an unsung hero in the history of college football, I'm talking about since they've been playing it, it's Stetson Bennett. I mean, where would we be without him? I mean, uh, we would not be able to run this Todd Munkin offense uh, without a guy that's so good at calling plays and doing things. Sure, he makes makes some things hard once in a while, but I think he gets bored with just the routine <laughs> once in a while, and he just goes and tries something. But I, 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 I the first, Yeah, the first half he threw to Brock Bowers like every other play, and then he forgot 19 was on the field the second half. I, mean, I don't. Think, I don't think he forgot him. I think that's just part of the uh, part of the deal is that the other team knows that's after too easy. after Brock catches five, then hey, don't worry about him. But I, I heard, you know, I watched this film. Don't lie with Dane and uh, and uh, Brent, and they do a tremendous job. But the, the thing that I like, he's got all these stats from Pro Football Focus, but. If you could tell me anybody in the history of, the, of football that's had 103 touches, 95 receptions, eight runs, and 21 touchdowns, that's a five-to-one ratio of touchdowns to to, uh, to his uh, to touches. Uh, touches. And, and then if you look at how many times he's actually been throwing the ball, like 123, and he's caught 95, you, talk, you show that to any defensive coordinator in the country, and they'll say, uh, who are we playing against, Superman here? So, uh, I could see down the stretch here, these next two games, we might protect these guys a little bit. Hopefully we get this game in hand and play some of these younger guys, but never works out like that. But uh, I could just see some balls out stuff with Bowers here down the stretch uh, once we get in the SEC and the playoffs. Uh, you know, we'll see how all that works out, but – I think there's a tendency to talk about, you know, we're, we're, we're a good team and everybody plays together and all that, which is true. But we've got some all-star players. Yeah. We've got some guys. Uh, and, and I didn't even mention Darnell Washington, who I think might go in the first round too. Um, yeah, I'm, fighting with, I'm fighting with all the Notre Dame people because I said that I thought – Georgia had the two best tight ends in the nation. And I get that uh, Meyer up at uh, Notre Dame. What's Notre fair. Dame's record? What's the record? <laughs> well, there's that. Meyer play left tackle. Who they play? Darnell could. I, yeah. I'm just saying to me, and you know the U, the tight end of Utah is fantastic. He's great, but I'm just thinking when you watch Darnell and you saw him get a lot of touches his last game. I, you talk about a mouth watering player of the week. That guy at that size doing what he does and just the, the blocks, blocks he thrown. So he's thrown crazy blocks. I mean, to me, I, I always think that. It just came out that the uh, Georgia offensive line is one of the nine semi- semifinalists for the uh, Moore Award, you know, best offensive line in college football. They're, they've made the top nine. Georgia's given up only seven sacks on the year. A lot of that goes well, to We're a great, to the court, we're great offensive line protecting. We're not a great yeah. blocking to run now. I mean – uh, but also protecting – got a scrambling quarterback. He's tough to bring down. He's scored on a couple of those touchdown runs. But to me, if you – if you get a covered sack, I think the, the secondary guy should get credit for the sack a little bit. I believe if you have a tip ball, that shouldn't count against you. When it comes to the stats, uh, low number of uh, sacks, if you have a mobile quarterback, he should get some credit for that, not just O-line. But these touchdown runs where Darnell Washington is absolutely killing somebody, I'm like, he should get a, a half a touchdown. They split sacks. Why can't you split touchdowns when you get a great block on the perimeter like he throws? So, oh, you just, just, That's not going to happen, but I mean, <laughs> you make a point there, but uh, – Hey, I, Roddy, I want to play. We got to get. We got another guy that <laughs> over there is going to get drafted high. I don't know what's going to happen with him. I hate he's had some issues, but uh, seven. I mean, Gilbert. Gilbert. I mean, he he's uh, right up there with those other two, and Delp's coming along too. So, Roddy, as a team, how many touchdown passes do you think Georgia has thrown this season? I have no idea. All right, it's 18. How many rushing touchdowns do you think Georgia has? 18. How many? 24. 32. So we got about eight that or one or two yard runs, I know, because we got it down there. We're, we're like unbelievable inside the red zone touchdowns and it's like 55 out of 56 or something like nation's that the best re, re, nation's best average and they've spread it around dejan edwards has seven kenny mcintosh has six stetson has seven kendall milton has five that blew my mind it's the only team in the nation that has that by the way 
No, no team could say we've got four or five guys with six rushing touchdowns. Uh, it, yeah. It's getting to the point where it's a, he's, it's a historical stat. If you go back and look at uh, some of the stuff Dave McMahon puts out, I, I should have done the math remembering that stat, but he's it, it's freakish how they run out. And I remember, Coach, uh, I feel bad for Dylan Bell. Remember how close he got? It was like within <laughs> inches. <laughs> to Coach's point, Brock Bowers has three on four carries. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we uh, – <laughs> It's insane. This is a messed well, up yeah, stat. But if we're, we're giving up enough plaudits here. Let's talk about some of the things that's got to happen now because you can't get too fat and sassy here. you got to keep working. Hey, the, yeah, there's still more games to come, but uh, we can talk about uh, things that have to happen. You have to go by Athens Ford and check them out when you get a chance. I want folks to swing by there, check out their 337 vehicles on the lot. Check out their lifetime powertrain warranty. Uh, check out their the fact that you can actually look at a car online. You can re- reach out to a – if it's a nasty day like today and you're like, hey, I need to go look at cars, but I don't want to go out in the rain. It's crappy out there. Reach out to Timmy or any of you guys in the sales department. They'll walk out there. They'll put an umbrella and take put you on a Zoom call or a FaceTime call and take you out there and walk or walk it around so you can see inside and outside. I also want to mention they have a $500 discount for uh, recent college grads and current college students. Same with the military. If you're a veteran or an active member of the U.S. military, you too may qualify for 500 bucks off. So check out our friends at Athens Ford. Uh, I'll be going up to uh, Lexington, Kentucky for this Georgia-Kentucky game. I will be driving my Ford Explorer up there. I'm not renting a car. I love my Ford, and I think you will love any of the vehicles you get there too, especially the fact if uh, you need any service done, you had a long drive coming up, Check out their service department. They will take good care of you when you get that chance. May, you'll need that Explorer because you may hit some ice on some of the mountain roads up to uh, Kentucky. Suck. Uh, speaking of ice and uh, things that are cold, if you want to work with some folks that uh, – uh, I was thinking of the people that have the franchises for like snow plows and stuff like that. That's a good franchise. And if you want to get a, get a good franchise, check out my perfect franchise, Andy Ledecky. He's a great guy. He does – a. Uh, his whole job is to get you into the right franchise. There's about 3,000 different franchises out there, and they're not all restaurants. I always thought to me, it, I didn't really think about franchises too much before we started talking to him, but I was like, franchises are just a restaurant. No, they're home businesses. There's the a lot of uh, service industry type stuff. So if you want to diversify what you have going on, you want to uh, uh, get out of the corporate rat race and gain control of your income and schedule, you want to be the person signing the front of the checks you know, and not the back, let Andy guide you through the comprehensive comprehensive franchise evaluation. He has tons of uh, franchises and business ownership experience, so you lean on him. It doesn't cost you anything. Go to myperfectfranchise.net and reach out to Andy Ludecki. Uh, he sponsors our show. He sponsors our website. Uh, he's a good guy. He's gotten a lot of UGA sports readers into new businesses where they are the boss. So hit up Andy Ludecki, and he will take great care of you. Coach Georgia and Kentucky and Kirby Smart said that in the past couple of years, this has been the most physical game that Georgia has played in a regular season schedule. But this year it looks like a different Kentucky, mainly because of its offensive line. What's Georgia facing against the Wildcats? Yeah, I mean, I went back and uh, studied that Vanderbilt game a little bit just to see, you know, watch it kind of off and on getting ready for our game. But, uh, you know, it just looked like that they thought they were going to, throw their helmets out there and win the game early. And then all of a sudden Vanderbilt sprang that uh, quarterback run situation, putting right in there. And it really made them worry about the perimeter. And then they were able to break some inside runs on them and threw some play action passes. But the biggest thing is Vanderbilt is last in the country in pass defense and close to last in sacks. And uh, they only got 103 yards passing and like, uh, and Vanderbilt had six sacks in the game. And it just shows you the inability for, for uh, which we've seen all year for Kentucky to protect Levis, who, you know, has got a lot of uh, love about being a big, strong quarterback, but he's not getting any help. They got two really fast guys on the perimeter and uh, Rodriguez is a good back. I mean, he takes on a lot of hits, but uh, I think our quickness on defense will help us gang tackle him. And then uh, if they do feel like they can, going to try to throw i think we can put some enormous pressure on them and cover them pretty well offensively uh, they don't give up a lot of plays with their defense big plays but um you know they just haven't been near the defense they've been in the past gave up 44 to tennessee 
They lost at home to South Carolina and Vanderbilt. I mean, any way you look at it, you can put lipstick on a pig and do all that stuff. But uh, we know that the history up there is a tough place to play and all that. But I don't know how tough it is right now the way the fans are, maybe for a quarter if they get it rolling. But I could see them. uh, Everybody's talking about how good the cats are. I was reading about Tom Izzo this morning, the basketball coach at Michigan State, they're playing the Kentucky Wildcats tonight. And he's saying, which might be the best Kentucky team I've ever seen. So hopefully a lot of those fans are worried about basketball and aren't going to be up there uh, banging away for the, for the cats, but uh, they got a tough road to hold to finish six. And I mean, they could be six and six here. They lose to us. And then they got to go play Louisville. Who's a good football team. If their quarterback's okay, he didn't get to play a lot against Clemson, but uh, I just think take care of business, uh, understand what's at stake. What I used to always tell my players in a game you're supposed to win is if you prepare like you're supposed, like you you, you're playing against a really good opponent and know your assignment. Anything they do that's out of uh, kilter and get you know good breaks and all that, we can overcome because we prepared for them. And you owe it to your buddies that have been working their ass off to play hard, so maybe they can get in there and play some more. So I think that's going to be the mantra this week. Uh, let's take care of business, uh, go up there and uh, play our game and uh, get some, get a lot of guys in there and then get ready for the rambling wreck from Georgia Tech or 12 o'clock kickoff, which when I read that yesterday, I did a couple of conga dances outside my house because I was worried they were going to be playing at 7 o'clock. We got an advantage there. We're playing at 12. Uh, LSU's playing at, at uh, 7 o'clock on the road at A&M. So uh, that's going to be – they're going to get home late. I hope they're real tired and uh, start off the week with a loss to uh, A&M, uh, but that probably won't happen. No. They, Kirby said that the team got in from Missouri, I mean, uh, from Mississippi State, like 1.30 in the morning, so it does that make a difference. I know a lot of the Georgia fans wanted a night game, and uh, they're like Kirby should be raising hell about this. I'm like, Kirby ain't raising hell about this at all. He doesn't want a night game. He wants that noon game. He wants to be prepped. And- <laughs> exactly. <laughs> what do they want a night game for? I mean, this – Think to show up the lights and the I'm like I don't want to and again a night game on the last game of the year right after Thanksgiving it's cold as hell. I'm, well, I'm, think I'm, about the big picture. We need to rest up for the next week. Uh, yeah. But the big picture for us, Probably, from a recruiting standpoint, it's always cool to have all the lights and show it off. And, and the, the fact there wasn't one all year, so a lot of folks were hoping for that. And I get it. I, they're they're beautiful, but to me that's more of a let's do that in the beginning of the season thing. Okay. I, I don't catch that stuff, so I, I'm sure you. I know. Well, you think about it like a coach. We're seeing it from the fan standpoint. It's right? from the entertainment standpoint. Like the TV programmers and marketers are telling you that Georgia and Georgia Tech is not a big draw. Kirby Smart doesn't care about that. He wants to do what helps the program best win championships, exactly. which is to play Georgia Tech at noon. If they could play it at 9 a.m., that'd be even better, but they don't do that. Uh, it, from an entertainment standpoint, I don't think Georgia should play Georgia Tech at all anymore. In fact, I would move Georgia versus Florida in that slot, but that wouldn't help Georgia. So I don't ever see that happening. Yeah. So uh, what we got next here? Well, if we, I think if we're going to drop uh, – it was talks about dropping Florida. Well, I mean, uh, dropping the uh, Jacksonville game and moving into home and home. If you're going to say, well, we can get rid of that tradition, we can get rid of the tradition of playing Tech too. Sure. I, I actually think oh, it's going to happen. Nine game, we're going to see a nine-game schedule here. And Yeah, uh, you're right. I, I think that's going to happen. I tell, you, I tell you two teams that aren't really – uh, looking forward to the uh, next couple of years, I wouldn't think Texas and Oklahoma. <laughs> I, I mean, Texas looked like Ned in the first reader against TCU, who hadn't played very good defense all year, and they shut them down. And uh, and Oklahoma loses. Uh, Oklahoma, I got so mad I was watching that game. They had fourth and one, uh, uh, West Virginia, and, and the nose guard for uh, Oklahoma lined up offside. On fourth and one, I mean, you got to really be well coached to do that. Oh, that's I know that's tough for you, but uh, I, 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 I don't know JT Daniels losing his starting I don't job. Are you anymore like I did after seeing this year? I mean, uh, I got to get somebody else as my second team. I think. <laughs> <laughs> hey, stick with your North Carolina. Yeah, I'm happy for North Carolina. I mean, they're, and they're. Of course, they're going to have another good basketball team. They got a good transfer in that Nance kid, Larry Nance's brother. 
Uh, I mean, son has come in there, and uh, if I got Larry Nance's brother, he'd be really old. But uh, Larry- <laughs> well, technically, it is Larry Nance Jr. is in the yeah, NBA right now, so it's yeah. Larry Nance's son and brother. He got another Larry Nance's son coming in there to transfer, and uh, they play. They play. I think Gardner Webb tonight, and uh, be watching that game up, and then I'll have to shut it off for the playoffs and. So what, what are we going to have some kind of game about the playoffs? All right, so here's the deal. And we're talking about North Carolina. This fits in here. I think that there are nine teams left in playoff contention. Georgia, Ohio State, Michigan, LSU, Tennessee, TCU, USC, Clemson, and North Carolina. That's the range that we're working with two weeks out, I guess three weeks out from what we're dealing with here. Do you see Georgia running the table? Kentucky, Georgia Tech, LSU. I do. I mean, the percentages are really with you. I mean, you know, basically playing two of the three at home, uh, the game over there, and uh, it's a big deal for us to win the championship. We haven't won it but once. Uh, And Kirby's really – that's been our goal all year to win the SEC championship. So, uh, I watched them Saturday against uh, Arkansas. Arkansas didn't have their quarterback, but uh, uh, they don't – they're not – tremendously laden with talent they got some good players but uh i feel good about us winning these next three i agree and so that would knock out lsu we don't have to talk about them though i do think they will beat uab and texas a&m before they play georgia but if uh, you did win the sec championship game where they end with two losses right all right let us get to that yes that's and there is a chaos scenario where that comes okay out. you got a chaos scenario i didn't know uh, tennessee south carolina and vandy they're gonna win those Yes. Okay. Yeah, they're they're winning out, but they got a real bad situation. They're not even the the division champion in their league. I don't care who they beat. Uh, that everybody's going to have to lose for Tennessee to get in. It has to be the twenty seven Alabama scenario, which that's exactly what happened for that to to come to pass. Ohio State has Maryland this week. Michigan has Illinois. Following week, they play each other. I think they'll both be undefeated for that, and I think either team would beat whatever. The other side of the Big Ten puts in the championship game, which I have no idea. Is that Illinois? Is that Purdue? I have no idea what's going to happen with that. I don't know that it matters. Yeah, I think Ohio State's got a better chance of getting in with one loss than Michigan does because Michigan's had such a terrible non-conference. I I know they played Hawaii. They played uh, Connecticut. I I can't remember who the other school was, but the the biggest thing there is their non conference. So it, Michigan's got to be undefeated to get in. Ohio State might get in at twelve and one if USC. Some of those teams we'll talk about them. Uh, there's got to be some teams lose, but uh, um, I don't I don't see two Big Ten teams in there right now. T- TCU has Baylor, Iowa State, and the championship game, which I'm assuming is probably Kansas State. Right. I feel like this about. Uh, we've got to remember the regional bias on this committee that picks all this stuff. There's going to be some West West coast bias. There's going to be some uh, mid America bias, and there's going to be some anti sec bias because everybody uh, thinks about you know, sec always gets two in and all that. If TCU ends up 13 and 0, they're in, if they're 12 and one, they might still get in. Because really? because of what they've done on the season, because of that bias factor, and the same thing is going to be true with USC. But a lot of it has to do with what happens with with us, Ohio State. You know, if we're if both of us are undefeated, those two are in. Now you're going to have a cluster to see what happens. But I say I say a uh, team like TCU with a uh, undefeated records in for sure. A twelve and one probably's in ahead of Tennessee. USC is the Pac 12s last hope, but it's a gauntlet down the stretch. UCLA, Notre Dame, and then the championship game, which is either Oregon or Utah, potentially Washington, but probably Oregon or Utah, the winner of that game this weekend. And what I see with USC is a dominant offense with a great quarterback, probably the best quarterback in the country. And a defense that's just holding on to every play. Uh, they, they, you just can't outscore everybody every week, and that's what happened to them against Utah. They, they ended up Utah went for two, but again, Pac-12 bias, West Coast bias. If they win the rest of their games, they're in. I don't care what happens, they're going to put them in at twelve and one because everybody wants to see 
Pac-12, uh, there's enough people on the committee. You watch them. They're number eight right now. Uh, if they beat UCLA, they'll keep moving up. Uh, you know, we'll have to see. But I, I'm just talking about from a veteran coach standpoint, not a Georgia fan like I am. This bias on the committee is they want four teams, not two that are from the SEC. They want to spread it out if they can. So Tennessee, as much as they deserve it for a lot of reasons, they're going to have to have all these teams that we just talked about lose. USC's got to be out. TCU's got to be out. Michigan. I mean, all those things got to happen. We had not even got to Clemson yet. Well, it's the <laughs> ACC situation because it's Clemson and it's North Carolina because Clemson has Miami, South Carolina, then the ACC championship against North Carolina. North Carolina has Georgia Tech, NC State, and then the ACC championship against Clemson. Either of those as a one-loss ACC champion is right in the heart of the conversation. Yeah, that. I think uh, North Carolina is 10 right now and the Clemson is like nine, but uh, you're going to see the same thing. We talked about the West coast a bit. Now you're going to get back over here. ACC champion at 12 and one gets in before a, a 12 and one. I mean, a 11 and one Tennessee. Because I like destruction, I have come up with the utter chaos scenario. And here is how this goes. If LSU were to beat Georgia, Michigan beats Ohio State, but then loses to Purdue in the Big Ten championship game, North Carolina wins out. TCU has one loss, but is the conference champion, so meaning they lose to Baylor or Iowa State. And then USC wins out. In that scenario, you would have Michigan 12-1, and but not a conference champion. Georgia, 12 and 1, but not a conference champion. Ohio State, 11 and 1, but not a conference champion. LSU, 11 and 2, as the SEC champ. Tennessee, 11 and 1, did not play for a championship. USC, 11 and 1, Pac 12 champ. North Carolina, 12 and 1, ACC champ. TCU, 12 and 1, Big 12 champ. That would be eight teams that you would have to parse through at that point. Well, US, I mean, uh, USC would be 12 and 1 instead of 11 and 1. So if they won it, but. But let's just say it like this. As long as we win the next uh, two games, then if we lose to LSU, we're in because we're number one. They're going to not knock us out all the way out of the top four. So I would say we're in. Then what's going to happen with uh, uh, Ohio State? I, I don't know. Uh, I don't know that. But I, I, I know this. USC, TCU, North Carolina, Clemson, and Georgia, I think, that's going to be a big, big shot. I don't see Michigan getting in if they would lose the championship game with their record. Well, what you're saying, though, Coach, if saying that about Georgia, if they win the next two, regardless of what would happen in Atlanta, they would be in. I think what you're saying is LSU doesn't have a path at that point because I don't think you could just – even if they're the champion, I don't think you could put LSU in over Tennessee considering they're head-to-head. Yeah, I mean – who knows? I don't know how you're going to look at it like that, but LSU's going to need a lot of help to get in. <laughs> They're the only team that's ever had that before, but they had all the help, and then they had the two lost no two national team, champion no in 07. Team, no two team uh, lost team has ever gotten in, have they? Not in the playoff, but in 07, they made it to the title game in, in the BCS. And oh, yeah. that well, weird scenario. We can talk about that later. That's a lot of what ifs, but at least yeah. we, we covered it. But I would just think all these Tennessee people are whistling Dixie right now thinking that they really are I mean they they think they are in they're like we got it we, we're there we don't have to go we don't have to get beat up in the SEC championship game and they're getting making- rewarded though by not playing a championship game and exactly. in, in, in a little bit if if these teams lose but uh they're getting discarded for not being a conference even division champ so uh you you know, you got to play these championship games and everybody's playing them uh, TCU USC Georgia, uh, Clemson, North Carolina, all of them are playing it. So you, you you need to be rewarded if you win it. And I get it. Where they're, they're looking at where they are now. They're like, oh, yeah, these teams are going to fall out. Then we'll move right up. I'm like, yeah, Georgia thought that too when a couple teams lost ahead of them. And, yeah, that, that didn't work out. So I'm with Georgia you fans should feel good about being in the spot it's in and not needing as much help from everyone else. Handle your business and you're good. They, they, don't, they don't need that at all. All right, uh, speaking of handling your business, today is Tuesday. It is Double Points Day over at Your Pie. You need to check them out. Uh, they have the spicy Italian pizza. It's here. It's not going to be here for long, so get one while you can. Coach and I actually had Your Pie pizza for the Watch Along Show. Dane, you weren't there. You missed out on the uh, 
the uh, Southern Heat. You know, you didn't get the buffalo chicken like I liked. Uh, we made Coach one with just about every meat you could find. Same price. Doesn't matter what you what you want. You design your pizza. You start with the crust. You put on the sauce. You put on whatever cheese you want. Then you add all the toppings. They don't charge you for any you know extra cheese or extra uh, toppings. You don't have to pay for all that. But what I tell folks to do, you know the, what the game time is this weekend. Go ahead and order your pizzas today. Order your salads. Order your breadsticks. Order your uh, custom pasta. You can get the big ones. You can get the 10-inch. They have the 14-inch ones, you know, the, uh, the 10-inch personal 14 big ones. Hit any of those, you know, set up your gelato. Order it today to be picked up on Saturday. That way you get your double points on Tuesday, and it uh, works out real great for you. So, so I may have missed out on the watch along show, but you're going to miss out this weekend because you're going to be cold on that sideline in Kentucky, I'm like cold. I was cold in Starkville. I'm going to go. I'll, to be, I'll be sitting there enjoying some pizza with Coach. I'm going to when I get into uh, Lexington, I'm going to go to a place called Toulouse and Bourbon. It is a fantastic uh, New Orleans style uh, restaurant up there because I love New Orleans food. It's my favorite food town in the entire world. And I've eaten at some crazy places, but it's really good. Speaking of New Orleans, one of our sponsors is a place called Prime Shrimp. Prime Shrimp is in New Orleans. They make fantastic shrimp. You can't, it can't miss on this stuff. They pre, uh, it's peeled, it's deveined, and it's seasoned. And they put it into these plastic bags and they freeze them. You go to primeshrimp.com. You order the, uh, you know, the uh, French Quarter Alfredo, this uh, garlic herb butter, the uh, lemon and cracked pepper, the Louisiana shrimp boil, or just a plain, you know, their signature season is phenomenal. Order any of their shrimps, and they will come to you in a box with dry ice in it. You take the bag out. You stick that in your freezer. Dispose of the dry ice. You can just leave it on the counter. It'll evaporate, or you put it in your freezer, and it'll evaporate. Uh, or you can add water to it and play with it. Like I uh, check out the prime shrimp sh- shrimp. Then when you want fantastic shrimp that's seasoned, that tastes phenomenal, you just take the little bag out like you would a, a bag of minute rice. You drop it in boiling water, four minutes out, you take it out, cut it open, dump it into your uh, shrimp tacos or on top of your uh, fettuccine or on top of rice or you know couscous, whatever you want to have it with, or just the plain if you want a, a shrimp cocktail. But try Prime Shrimp. Use promo code UGA Sports. Get 20 bucks off your first order. It's $20 off your first order from Prime Shrimp. And that's basically a free dual bag, you know, because each uh, order has two bags in it. You get one of those for free. So hit up our friends at Prime Shrimp when you get a chance. Let's get to some questions for Coach Donnan from UGASports.com. This is from D Rock UGA. Coach Donnan, would you likely say that Keith Jackson and Champ Bailey are the two greatest football players that you ever coached? And then who would be the best players that you coached against? Well, there's certainly uh, champs the best all around. You know, he played both ways. I'm looking forward to him getting inducted in the College Football Hall of Fame. He's already in the Pro Football Hall of Fame. That's going to be out here in a couple of weeks. But uh, And Keith's in there, too. But, uh, you know, Jerome Brown was the best player I ever played against, coached against, uh, played for Miami. Uh, just unbelievable uh, dominating defensive lineman. Uh, just unreal. So I, I would say he's the best player uh, I ever coached against. Oh, yeah, that question was from D Rock UGA. This one from Bush Dog. What are your thoughts on using thirty as opposed to six at the goal line? Some Dejan Edwards at the goal line question. Oh, that's a good question. Never have been a real proponent of a scat back type on the goal line. Although we we have done a pretty good job of letting uh, Edwards kind of bounce around and fill the gash. Uh, uh, you know, McIntosh is more of a a slasher type guy that's got the power to, uh, you know, we've been very successful. Uh, people can talk any, all, everybody can, can find something wrong with, with uh, everything you do, but it's hard to get a yard on the goal line. You look at Minnesota the other day, they couldn't score down there against the bills. And then they ended up bills fumble the, the uh, quarterback center exchange. And I would tell you this, if you're a high school coach or a little league coach or, or any kind of coach, Practice taking a quarterback center exchange with a with the center covered and both guards covered. If you got to try to run the clock out, uh, because that's very difficult for that center to get it up and then the quarterback to ride him out. So that's just not a routine play. We used to practice that three or four times a week because you know Minnesota ends up almost uh, getting back. They got back in the game and won it because they fumbled the snap on the half yard line. 
and uh, because of Jack, the guy back. But getting back to uh, the, the whole deal, I, I mean, I feel good about where we are. That's for sure. From 83 WR Dog, how will the 30 degree weather in Lexington affect George's game plan? Well, well, let me look into this. I'm Karnak the Magnificent. <laughs> oh, oh. <laughs> hey, uh, nothing against his answer question, but who knows? I don't think it'll bother us much. We practiced yesterday out in the cold. Uh, it was uh, the high 30s in Starkville, and they played pretty well. Very in at uh, Starkville, pretty good. Uh, I think it's a little. You change bit, what you do. It's going to be a little bit different uh, scenario because of, they run that hammer and tong offense. You know, I mean, uh, uh, but we should be okay. I just hope we don't. It doesn't become real blustery and affect the passing game. You know, uh, it's going to be cold catching the ball, but all of a sudden the wind's blowing. It makes it tough too. But uh, certainly a good question that he had. That's that's for for sure. I don't want to make light of it. I'm just saying. I, I feel like we're ready for, you know, we're an all seasons team. You know, we can play in any kind of weather. But I tell you what, I do like if we win the next two games, our next three games are going to be indoors and it's not going to be any weather. That's a great point. Uh, we, we would play Mercedes Benz twice in a row and then play out of LA uh, in that new place out there, that new facility. You know, the first player was to do any kind of warm up in, in Starkville. I, I don't always get to see this. So I was on the field two hours before kickoff. Is it, and a kicker? it was Jack Pod Lesney, and he was walking each spot in the end zone closest to George's locker room. And uh, he was just taking a piece of grass and dropping it to see at every spot of the state. He went and did this up and down the field to see what would that piece of grass do if the wind was blowing at that particular spot? Meaning this is not a full around stadium in Starkville. So it kind of had open corners and he just wanted to oh, he did a great job on the kickoffs. Uh, that was something that worried me, their kickoff return. And they killed us on a punt return. He just but, wanted to uh, know if it got windy, what was it doing at each spot? And yeah. that's, people don't see that preparation. I used to tell our kickers, I said, I'm not interested in going out and having a performance for the game and let everybody ooh and ah you and all that stuff. I mean, you don't need to kick that much before a game. Maybe you can check the win and all, but look, save it for the games, man. I mean, <laughs> you, you watch some of these high school kids. I go to a game, and they, the game starts at 730. They're out there at 530 kicking field goals. I mean, I mean and they don't even hardly ever kick a field goal in high school. But uh, I, I like guess they, they do the same in college. They warm up, and they're hitting the old ladies in the stands because they don't have the uh... – Nets net. up, you know, yeah. and people trying to go to their seat getting pegged on the side of the head by a kick. I'm like, man, you don't come on. Yeah. I tell you, one of the things that always bothered me about the sidelines warming up was other teams' cheerleaders, uh, you know, haunting us or getting after us and saying stuff to our players and all. I mean, they, you know, I can like m most of these guys have never even had a jock on over there yelling at these these guys and we we're, were playing North Carolina playing Clemson one year and they had this sissy uh, uh, guy over there just kept getting on us and so I went over to Matt Kupek and I told them I said hey Matt I'm gonna tell Billy to run down the sideline I want you to throw the ball right towards that uh, little sissy ass uh, cheerleader there and I'm gonna let Billy run right over and so we had Billy Billy Johnson who's about 6'1 230 fullback and he never even called a pass, much less practice one. But we, I let him run down. I said, Billy, I'm about to, let's see in case we get you open. Let's see if you can catch him. He didn't know what I was talking about. I said, he's going to throw it right close to that cheerleader. And I said, no matter what, even beside the bounds, catch it. He piled drive that guy into submission, man. That was pretty cool. <laughs> That's like a movie scene. That's about the longest yard. I love it. You mentioned North Carolina, a UGA dog guy says, does Coach Donnan still follow North Carolina State football closely? Oh, don't tell me about that. Can you believe that the Pack lost to Boston College? That's almost as bad as Vandy beating Kentucky. <laughs> he follows uh, it. I, I got that one. I mean, I had a bad day the other night. That's why I was so glad that, that Georgia won. I mean, the Pack lost, uh, and then the OU lost. The uh, Pack got a couple bad calls, too, but. Boston College has been down, and they, they ended up beating the pack. From Blocker 57, any thoughts on who takes Auburn's job or how much longer Nick Saban will keep coaching? Yeah, I think it's a two-man race right now between uh, Lane Kiffin, if he wants to leave Ole Miss, and if 
he doesn't, I think they probably they're looking at uh, Hugh Freeze and just because of his success in the Western Division, I think he's going to be a little bit have a trouble getting uh, okay because of the stuff that happened to him uh, with the NCAA. Uh, not necessarily his his own problems with his uh, off the field stuff, but I would say those two guys and they, you know maybe Matt Rule's name's coming up. The Baylor coach who was coaching at the Panthers. I mean, kind of like Williams doing a good job, but they're not going to give a unproven coach that's never been been a coordinator the head job there just because he played it played there. I think it's too big a deal. As far as Nick, I think probably. Chap, because they lost two games this year, you're going to try to keep coming back next year. But you're going to have a new quarterback, and a lot of they lose a lot of good players. I mean, uh, the, last year was a rebuilding year for them. This year was supposed to be their year. So, uh, they I, mean, I thought before the season started, I thought they were going to be lights out. That was tongue in check about last year. I don't know. He was I talking know. about it. Was, I thought I thought that was karma, though. You know, like, oh, realistically, though, they lost two games on the last play of the game, but they could have also. They won some on the last play of the game, too. And then last week they won one on the last play of the game because they held uh, Ole Miss. Uh, I couldn't believe what Lane Kiffin was doing down there on the goal line. I mean, never kicked field goal a couple times and then ran the ball down there and then threw three passes. I mean, you know, he's a very brilliant offensive coach, but you'd have to really question their play call in there at the end of the game. Question from Pete Tech One. When a team like Kentucky loses to a big underdog like Vandy, does it demoralize them for the next game or do they come out playing energized? Will That's Levis did say that. Will Levis question. said that he wants them playing with their piss hot. Well, you know, I've heard that uh, saying before, uh, but there's nothing good can happen when you lose to Vanderbilt. I mean, I don't care how, how much you want to get your stinger going and all that and get bit fired up certainly this is not the Kentucky team we've seen the last three or four years they got holes in their offensive line they they don't have uh near the defensive presence up front as far as just two three deep big guys uh fairly good solid secondary plays a lot of zone have trouble in the kicking game and haunting them against Ole Miss and uh against Florida uh they they barely beat Florida uh they lost to South Carolina and they lost to uh, Vanderbilt. So, uh, plus they lost to Ole Miss. So, you know, they could they could give us a fight if if we go up there and don't do what we're supposed to, and you know, really mess around and give them some breaks. They they could play with us, but this team's too focused. I mean, we're we're on a mission. Hey, go dogs. Before you ask any of the questions, I want to mention our friends over at uh, Academia Brewing Company and tell you about some of the new stuff they have. Check out this uh, uh, chicken salad wrap that they got. I mean, that looks phenomenal. So they're doing a they do have a specialty food out there, but they got their homemade chicken salad, lettuce, tomato wrapped in a flour tortilla, and served with choice of side. It looks phenomenal. You can see the pictures there. Uh, of course, their Hopper Dijak is back, one of the uh, best beers on the market. I know people like uh, if you like a hoppy beer. That is it. Hopper Dijak gets all these rave reviews. It has a its own cult following. Of course, they, the other deer, the uh, other day they had a, uh, a smoked half chicken plate. We got a giant chicken. You know, the whole thing is yours. I did not have that when I went uh, there Sunday to meet my father in law when he came up to town. Uh, we were there for the biscuit and beer brunch, but I wish I'd gotten the whole half chicken. But here's the thing: my wife wants. I got to go get one of these. A Nana Pudding Martini. So it's a uh, martini uh, made with vodka, banana liquor, uh, liqueur, hazelnut liqueur, vanilla extract, and whipped cream and cinnamon, nutmeg spices, uh, garnished with caramel and vanilla wafer crumbles. That just looks fantastic. Mm. So hit up Academia Brewing Company. You see the food. You see the beer. You see the ambiance. It's a great place to watch the game. Check them out when you get a chance. And Dave, if you can bring up our uh, friends over at Dead Soxy, I would really appreciate that because – Dead Soxy has a – basically, it is a Black Friday deal. Okay, it's a holiday promo. It's pre-Black Friday. I know we're still ahead of Thanksgiving, but a lot of people are getting excited about it. Dead Soxy has – they did this deal last year where basically if you uh, spend 50 bucks or more, you get 20% off. 150 bucks or more, you get 30% off. 250 bucks or more, 
40% off. So check out the folks at Dead Socks. They hit the Holiday Pro. The code is Holiday Pro. They all come with free shipping, so you don't have to worry about shipping. But again, 50, 150, 250, 20, 30, or 40% off. So if you want to get great dress socks, great Georgia socks, great uh, Ole Miss socks, uh, South Carolina socks, you, anybody, you have people in your office that you want to take care of, people in your family that are not Georgia fans, you know, you, you feel you feel bad for them. But you at least want them to be, you know, have good socks and to have uh, great, warm, comfortable socks that don't fall down. Check out the holiday sale at Dead Socks. It's one of their biggest deals of the year. The more you buy, the more you save. And the code is Holiday Pro. Check them out. All right. We have a uh, good many questions left. So let's try to go speed round the rest of the way and get as many as we can. Bulldog guys says, Coach Donnan, I know before game coaches uh, get to meet with the announcers on TV and then the announcers get to see practice. With that in mind, did you ever have a situation where there was an announcer that you didn't trust or thought maybe leaking some information? Ooh, good question. You know, it's uh, it would be a suicide as far as career suicide for a guy to divulge something you told him on the air. I mean, you, you can't do that. Uh, so I, I, I never felt like that there's somebody I didn't trust. And there were some referees that I didn't trust. Uh, <laughs> uh, and I know they were crooked, and uh, I called them. But uh, as far as uh, – and most referees are really good, but there's some that were – just low, low rent. But I, I think you just got to understand it's part of the job. Um, th these guys are prepping for the game. They can do a better job of uh, articulating to the, the fans what's going on. If they've got an idea what your plan is and who you're attacking and what, what can do. I mean, that that's just, and if you feel bad about uh, telling them stuff that you, you're worried about it, then just don't just be very generic. But uh you, you just – like I've always felt like, and I've counseled some coaches and talked to them about it. Hey, just think about the persona that you are showing when you come off the field at halftime. And this this lady that's trying to, you know, do her job and you're just, you know, just not even giving her the time of day. And you just look like a complete idiot acting like that. I think, that, hey, you just listen to the question answer it and go on. I think Kirby does a really good job with it. Uh, some coaches act like they can't wait to get inside. And what are you go, What are you going to do when you get inside? You're the head coach. You're going to wait for everybody else to tell you what's going on. Anyhow, beside offense and defense kicking game, you're going to get a synopsis of it. Uh, unless you just really got to go to the bathroom pretty bad. You, you need to go in and talk to that person. So uh, I, I've never distrusted anybody in the media, though, uh, uh, as far as the TV and radio, now some some people that uh, do some stories with the scribes now have had some issues with some of those people. Uh, Roddy. <laughs> no, I'm not. <laughs> Dude, when I was writing for Bulldog Magazine, it wasn't even under my name. So <laughs> I, I think one thing that every coach needs to understand is, is that, and, and appreciate is all these guys that are – hounding you and asking they have a job and that's their job to try because they want the, the people are hungry for info and the more you respect that the better you're going to be uh because you can't you can't come out on top uh, getting on some writer about something i mean I, I think that's ridiculous the volume of media people that cover georgia is a compliment and i can tell you mississippi state does not have that level of interest and it was reflected in just the sheer number of media people that cover them. Half of their media workroom was Georgia people, and Georgia was the away team. Yeah. Well, I mean, we got a lot of national press all over us now, too, with being ranked number one. Uh, I'll combine these Bayou Dogs 70-53 and then Go Dogs 13-71. Uh, is there anything Kentucky's offensive line can do to improve their – level of play and improve Levis's level of play. And then what do you attribute to Will Levis's lack of success this season? Is there anything Kentucky can do to fix that? Yeah, I think they just got to try holding and hope you don't get called. I mean, <laughs> not gonna give me quicker feet. I mean, if the guys, guys got you beat, hold them and hope it doesn't get called. I'm not being funny. About no, that. I agree. I, I I, I've and, uh, coached the same thing. Hold, hold more. And, and then as far as, Levitz, you know, he got a turf toe and had to miss a game, and he just doesn't seem as mobile. And 
he, he hasn't had the protection. I mean, they lead the SEC in number of sacks, so uh, that, that's probably a little bit why he's been down. But, you know, last year we, we really curtailed them. I mean, and they had a lot better. They had that one Wandell Robinson, that receiver and everything, and uh, they didn't do anything except that last drive. They looked like they're playing for the world championship. The game was over, but kept calling timeouts and going out of bounds at like 1920 play March. And they, you know, it's like they won the world championship when they scored finally on Georgia. So, uh, but you know, you, you got your program, you got to coach your team like you want to, but I don't think coach Stoops has ever beaten Georgia has he uh, and his record that, uh, I think it's the only team beside Alabama that he hasn't beaten uh, in the S- SEC. From Wville Dog 94, when Georgia goes into the prevent offense, is what he calls it, uh, he says it seems like Georgia's playing pretty conservative. Three runs up the middle, going three and out. says, I know Kirby's content with killing clock, but it seems like it would eat more clock if you mix up the play calling, maybe some outside screens and short passes to get first downs. Is th- but he said there's also a reason I'm not coaching. What am I missing? Well, he makes a point. I mean, the other other team knows that you you've take taking the air out of the ball and they're selling the ranch and bringing people. So uh, you, you maybe that's something we're going to work on a little bit more, maybe just faking up in there and throwing a little ball in the flat or, you know, whatever it might be. We've been for the most part, pretty good about running the clock out, but uh, at the same time, there's a risk and reward. I mean, so what if you punt, but it's certainly, so what if you punt is not the answer. If, if that gives a team a, chance to come back and uh, seal the game with a score. So you got to look at what's the chance of us winning. You know, if you got one play to win the game and it's third and three, throw the ball to Bowers, even if it's a little risk involved. I mean, go with your best guy. We'll go with two more here. Some people ask about LSU. We're going to push that to another week because Georgia doesn't play them yet. So, but we'll we'll have plenty of discussion about that later on. This is from G Funk Twenty. How much of a concern does UGA have at outside linebacker? There doesn't appear to be tremendous dudes next to Nolan Smith with him being out. Bill Solid, but not game breaking. Marvin Jones Jr. seems young. Sherman uh, seems like his time has passed, is what G Funk says. And Chambliss is solid too. Are you worried about OLB? Yeah, we got some issues there. I mean, you can't lose a guy with the significance of uh, Nolan Smith and not, uh, and it's very similar to last year when we lost Adam Anderson. Uh, you know, right down the stretch, it was tough. Uh, and we had to adjust to it using some different uh, ball players in there. But fortunately, we had Nolan Smith and Bill was a backup. But now Bill's the, the number one guy. Uh, I can see us using that Jaguar po- package where we continue to put in. Uh, some extra guys on, on past situations and uh, Washington's one of them, number 11 and then uh, number seven, Marvin Jones jr. But down after down on our base defense, I just think Bill and the uh, Chambliss are doing a good job and th- they're the type of guys that, uh, and I've talked to Roddy about this and maybe you too, Dane off there, that some guys are really good when they're surrounded by nine or 10 other good players. But if you just look at them one-on-one, uh, they don't make as many plays because they're they're not the athletes that that some of these superstar guys are. But they they play within the realm of the defense and play technique, and they play assignment, and they're they're set up to play that position, which is to play your role and do your job. So I think we'll be fine there. We won't be dominant, but we'll be okay. And projecting forward, Darius Smith is a name in future years. Everyone oh, needs to keep track is, of that guy is really fast. He's going to be about 245. He's a budding, budding big time player. I mean, really good. And I can't say enough about some of the development of certain guys like Bullard and Lassiter. Uh, you look at them right now and when fall camp started, just amazing how they've taken the coaching and how, how much better they are. Not to mention Malachi, who we knew was going to be good, but I mean, he's a big time player. <laughs> and he's really, uh, you got two safeties there that a lot of pro teams would like to have right now. We'll wrap with this question from Simplicity Coach Can Stetson Bennett change any play he wants to with the line of scrimmage, or is it just some plays? He seems to do a really good job of getting Georgia in the right matchups, or maybe is that all Munkin? Well, it's Munkin from a standpoint he coaches and Munkin and Buster Faulkner, they train, you know, you're at the liberty of your quarterback once a game starts. Uh, uh, sometimes you'll look to the sideline and they'll 
uh, particularly in a spread offense where they'll have a play and then they'll change the play from the sideline. They'll go up there. But most of our changes are at the line based on what he's been taught, uh, whether to change a run to one side or the other, whether to change a pass to a, a run or vice versa. But most of it's protection wise, getting the right kind of look to take care of what they're showing. And then we have the RPOs where he can throw it or run it based on what the team does. And we had a deal the other night, which we had to question, well, why did we throw the ball on third and three when we were trying to run the clock out? Looked like with, with maybe trying to make a first down and then get, get in there. But it was an empty formation, and they have a, a situation where you, you can throw the ball or run the quarterback draw. But if you get outside pressure, it, it's hard to run the quarterback draw. So he ended up throwing it. And it ended up being a, a bad play because we didn't catch it, and then we had the bad punt. So he can change anything. He can. He's got a lot of liberty there. But uh, if Mary Beth tells him not to change it now, he won't. <laughs> That's all the questions we have time for. Uh, we'll sneak some of these in in future weeks. Some stuff about LSU. Some just coaching stories. We'll have a full off season for that kind of stuff. But man, what a packed show! Oh well, yeah, we can just carry him over to next week. I doubt there'll be a whole lot of people wanting a preview of uh, Georgia Tech, so we'll, we'll mention yeah. that next week. So, can't look, you can't look ahead, that's for sure. That's part of coaching, but yeah. bring on LSU is what the old coach says. I'm, <laughs> bring them on. Don't look ahead, but bring them on. I love it. All right, folks, uh, a big shout-out to Athens Ford, Your Pie, Prime Shrimp, My Perfect Franchise, Academia Brewing Company, and, of course, Dead Soxy. Remember the Dead Soxy sale? Hit them up. Um Now's a good time. Uh, tune in next Tuesday. We'll be reviewing the Georgia versus Kentucky game, and we'll uh, answer the, some of the questions we didn't get to, plus the questions in the comments. If you have questions over there, drop them in. We'll try to get to those next week. And we'll look ahead to the last game. Uh, we'll having a pre-Thanksgiving uh, show here. We'll, we'll meet you with you Tuesday, and then everybody will have a great th- Thanksgiving, and then close out the season with uh, Georgia Tech that following Saturday. We will see I was you going to tell you that, reading it, listen to that dead Soxy. This is great. Uh, they they're really good socks, and they've sent sent some to you and to Dane and to me. But just remember that old joke that the uh, lady said to the to her boss that sorry I was late, but I had a pair of hose on, guaranteed not to run. No, oh, God, that was bad. Oh, that was right. horrible. That was, <laughs> oh, God damn you, coach! All right, that's all the time we have for this week's show. That's it. Bye. See y'all later.